Good evening, and welcome, welcome to my Geek of the Week biography video. When I posted my first video to Board Game Geek, um, that's how I opened it. Well, aside from the Geek of the Week stuff, and I actually had a game set up here, but I wanted to recreate that intro, but <laughs> I didn't want to go to the trouble of setting up Mansions of Madness on this table, so I skimped a little bit. And also at that time, I promised I would never do another one of those goofy introductions again, but I, uh, I've broken that promise enough times that I figured once more wouldn't hurt. So my name is Rodney Smith. You probably don't know who I am, um, but even if you do, you might not know about this whole Geek of the Week thing. I knew of it, but I didn't really understand it, and I had to learn it because I got nominated for it. So <laughs> let me just share with you quickly, just in case you don't know. Basically, on the Board Game Geek forums, there is a, a section that's dedicated to the Geek of the Week, and they give a thread each week to a new Board Game Geek member. Well, not necessarily a new member, but to a different one each week. And then that person comes on, and they, they do a little written-up biography, or they can do a video like I'm doing here. And then for the week, people are invited to ask them serious or silly questions, and then that person must respond. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this, I really am. So please do write your questions and I'll be happy to answer them no matter what they are. Maybe I'll post some other stuff during the week as well to sort of keep things moving along. Anyway, another thing that's really kind of neat about this whole process is it's not a popularity contest. Uh, how you get picked is the person who was the Geek of the Week last time nominates the next one. So just before I move into the biography part of this video, I just want to take a quick moment to thank my nominator. Joel Eddy, who most of you probably know about. Uh, if you don't, definitely please look into his videos. Uh, he does an excellent board game review series. I, I consider myself a board game media junkie. Anytime I have spare time, I'm usually watching a video review or a walkthrough or I am listening to a podcast. And Joel's just really stands out to me because he does such a wonderful job of presenting how a game works in his video. He couples that with excellent video work and then all the editing that goes into that, it just it's it takes a lot of time and effort. I know it does for him to do these, and he does them so well. I just I always walk away understanding how the game works, and then uh, when he gives his review piece, um, there's nothing pushy about it. I always walk away knowing exactly what he thinks about the game, and I never feel like um, he's closed the door on on what I should think about the game either. Um, it, it's hard to sort of quantify what that that feeling is to to have someone share their opinion and and have it be meaningful without being pushy. Um, but he, he really does it. He nails it. And I, I appreciate that. So it meant a lot to me uh, on a personal level to, to, to get the nomination from Joel. Uh, so thank you so much, Joel. Uh, but anyway, before this turns into an hour-long video, I should probably jump into the biography part of it, which is my job here. So uh, let me just start by saying I was born in uh, 1975 um, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's in Canada. And the earliest games I remember playing... Um, well, one of the ones I remember, it was uh, I think it was called Cat and Mouse, or Cat and the Mouse, or something like that, or Cat and the Mice. <laughs> you guys will probably remember and tell me. I should look this up. But basically, it was, a, it was a board. It had almost like three dimensions. It was mainly flat. And you had these plastic mice, and you moved them along the board by rolling a die. And based on where you ended up, there would be a picture of a mouse on it. And where its nose was pointing, that's where you turn your mouse. And so the next time you roll the dice, that's the direction you'd be heading. So it was kind of like a, a grid, right? That you'd be moving along. However, there were these little, um, this is the 3D part, there's these little pits you could fall into. So if you rolled a die and you fell into a pit, then you, I think in the pit was a picture of a cat. So it was like the cat caught you, basically. And I believe you had a certain number of these mice and you wanted to be the last player remaining. <sighs> Gosh, I wish I could remember the name of that game for sure. Uh, and I might even have botched the rules a little bit. But I hope some of you are familiar with that game. If you are, let me know about it in the comments below because uh, I, I, I enjoy sharing that, uh, that memory of that game with, with somebody out there. Um, but the, probably, you know, beyond that, of course, I played um, the Mills, the Parker Brothers, the Milton Bradley games, you know, I uh, did some Clue and some Risk and that sort of thing growing up. Hungry Hippos, <laughs> if that's even a game. Um, but the first serious game that I remember playing, oddly enough, was a war game, uh, actually, which surprises me because I don't really have um, war games in my collection today. Uh, but I, I was thinking back, and the first war game I remember picking up, well, the first one I thought I remember picking up was Ambush! Exclamation mark. Uh, it was from Avalon Hill Games, and then I remembered, no, the reason why I bought Ambush was because I found that in a little mini catalog that came in... Um, another war game that I picked up first, which was Empires in Arms. And there may be an S in there that shouldn't be. I can't remember the exact title. And I can't even really tell you why in the world I want to have that game. Because I never played any games like that before. I um, played Risk and Monopoly and stuff. I do remember a phase where I was really interested in 
role-playing games. And my parents had no interest in me playing role-playing games. They came from that generation of parents that was concerned about the negative influence, perhaps, that uh, D&D could have on a young mind. So, so we didn't have that in our home. But I remember from computer magazines that I would read, seeing um, screenshots from Bard's Tale, things like that, Alt Ultima, maybe, Mail, maybe that's farther along. But anyway, from, from these games, and it would show humans or creatures broken down into all these stats. You could define people by a variety of attributes and skills and their equipment, and they could have anything and, and do anything, and you could do that in a gaming environment. And, you know, I looked at these rules for, for role-playing games from, that my friends had, and they were these thick, thick manuals. And I think I must have somewhere along the line associated what I perceived to be all this incredible fun tied into these very thick, complex rules. And so when I came across this war game, which was not a role-playing game, but it looked like it offered all this complexity and all these choices. I think the box said something like, um, you know, it would take you from two hours to two months to play, depending on what you played. I think that just really got under my skin. Like, I want to see what's in this box and how that would work. I remember going to my parents and saying, listen, guys, if it was expensive at the time to get this game, um, it probably would have been around... I don't know, 80 bucks maybe, maybe more. I said, listen, if I save up and pay half of this, would you guys pay the rest of it so I can have it sooner, but then I'll pay the rest of it off to you guys over time. And they agreed to that, and I got the game, and it was everything I could have wanted out of the box. Big, big map. Like, it took a big part of the floor. Tons of tokens, tons of tokens all over the place, and a rule book that was, I think, you know, maybe 80 pages long with small print. Maybe it wasn't that long, but it, it was long, and there was a lot of stuff going on in there. But then, who was I going to play this game with? And there was, you know, I remember feeling a bit defeated and deflated by that. I, I played a couple games by myself, playing both sides. But I, I came to realize that I'm not going to be able to teach this game to anyone who's going to want to play it with me. My parents aren't going to want to play it. My friends, this wouldn't have interested them. And, you know, like I said, I'd almost forgotten all about this. And it wasn't until I started thinking about this, it made me think... You know, I wonder if that's part of why I get so much meaningful satisfaction out of making these videos that I do about teaching games, some of them complex, and feeling um, connected to the other people that I'm, you know, through the online teaching these games too, and that it allows me to vicariously experience these games that maybe even I still don't get a chance to play as often as I'd like to. And I don't know, Psychology 101 aside, I mean, I don't know really what, what all that says, but it made me feel like there's some connection there. There's something inside of me that... that enjoys that experience of learning a game and, and, and trying to pass it on in some way. And, and maybe that's just something that was, was missing in my youth uh, as a part of a hobby that I wanted to explore. And today, although I still don't play war games because, again, I really don't have the people around me who would play them, I enjoy vicariously learning them through other media creators like Marco Wargamer and um, Callendale and those guys who constantly review these kinds of games. And I get to see what's going on. I really enjoy, enjoy being able to do that. But anyway, going back a little bit there, so after the war game phase, <laughs> the sort of failed war game phase, Ambush was a success, actually, because that's a solitaire game. I could play it by myself, and I had a lot of fun with that, and I got to have the stats for the soldiers and playing that. I really like that game. I'd like to see that. Let's, let's have a Kickstarter on that or something, guys. Let's bring that game back, because I would get that again, and I would play that again. Anyway, um, or some variant of it that maybe isn't quite so complex. But anyway, um, after that, there was a period of time where I wasn't playing a lot of games. But the, the bug was always there. And so I went uh, and I came across at some point Board Game Geek. And I started to explore in there. And for a long time, I just like would be a casual kind of viewer, see what the games were. But a lot of the games at that time that were kind of hot were Euro games. Um, I can't remember the exact timing, but maybe it was like Agricola and Puerto Rico and those kind of games. And, and nothing about them really appealed to me visually. Um, nothing really should have appealed to me visually about Empires and Arms either, to be honest. But at that point in my life, I think I was looking for a little more flash, a little more theme in my games. And, and I wasn't seeing it there until I came across the game, Arkham Horror. Ladies and gentlemen, this was it for me. Uh, when I saw this game on Board Game Geek, I got excited uh, because there was the complexity. Yes, <laughs> there was the complexity there. But all of these components, and they were really good looking and, and dripping with theme. I mean, this is, this is what I was looking for, if you will. This was the the thing I needed to get me back and interested in this hobby, really, uh, full force. And so I picked up the, the game, and I put it on the table, and I got my daughter to play it with me, and she actually enjoyed it, which was, which was really great. So we got to enjoy this experience together. I think she likes Octopus, so uh, the Cthulhu character <laughs> kind of automatically appealed, and she didn't mind the dark theme. 
And, and it was a lengthy game, but we had fun and we did it over a couple of, of days. But then, I mean, then I was hooked, if you will, to um, you know, what this board gaming hobby could be for me because I didn't really realize that games like this existed. And that got me going to Board Game Geek all the time. And, and games like this, people were talking about. People like, uh, like Lance, Undead Viking, uh, this is one of his most favorite games. And, and I get to find out that there's lots of other people who really like these kind of games as well. And that really excited me. And that's when I discovered Board Game Video Reviews. Are you kidding me? This was fantastic because I was enjoying Arkham Horror, of course, but what other games were like it and which ones were any good? So I could go on Board Game Geek, I could go on YouTube, and I could watch people who are willing to take the contents of games, just dump them all over the floor for me, and tell me about the game, tell me whether or not they liked it or not. And so this really helped a lot. I, I came across Board Games with Scott, Scott Nicholson, uh, of course started watching The Dice Tower, Tom Vassell, and got to see so many videos about so many games and so many ties. Uh, and so this was great. I was just eating this up because um, you know it influenced the kind of decisions I was making about what games to purchase and not purchase. And it really helped me thin out sort of what I was looking for, which was, which was really, really great. Uh, but it created a, a new kind of problem for me. And the problem that it created was that I knew that all these games I was collecting and wanting to buy, a number of them I would not really get to experience and enjoy. It really goes back to that Empires in Arms thing because I was able to game with my children and that was a lot of fun, but there was gonna be games they didn't wanna play. And honestly, you know, I wanted my gaming experience to go beyond my own family and playing with people who were younger than I was. So if we had stayed in Halifax, that wouldn't have been a problem because there's a Wonderful, the gaming hobby there I think is really blossoming. There's lots of people and lots of stores you can go to, but we moved to Prince Edward Island, which is a very small province in Canada. And we live in a very small community on Prince Edward Island. And we didn't know anyone there. I didn't know any gamers. There's no store there locally for me to go to. So I started feeling once again, like as much as I was embracing the hobby and, and wanting to get more and more into it, was this a mistake? Should I actually be getting away from this and trying to go do something with my time and free time that I had that would be you know more fulfilling, something I could explore more fully. And that's around the time that I got this idea. I could try to connect to the gaming community at large by creating my own media content and putting it out there on the internet. And then people would see that and hopefully interact with me and then I would start to feel possibly more connected to that, that bigger part of this hobby. Now I kind of skipped a step there. One of the most influential video series that I watched was by Jeremy Salinas. You might also know him as Dragon Strike. He was making video reviews the way I would have wanted to do it. Uh, he just took such great attention to detail in terms of showing off the components, getting right in close to all those parts, and just the way he put all that information into a really slick and clean package. I, I really, really enjoyed watching his videos, and it was very inspiring to me. It made me think, this, this is what I would want to do, because ever since I was a young kid, I enjoyed playing with video cameras and would make skits, and, and as I grew up, I, I kept it as a hobby and also did some, some jobs related to it as well. And so I was thinking, man, this is a way I could combine that aspect I really enjoy along with the hobby aspect I really enjoy. And then, if things work out, maybe I could start to feel more connected to that bigger gaming community. So, the only problem with that was, I just didn't want to be Jeremy Salinas number two. And if odds were good, I'd be an inferior version of that. So, I, now that said, I, I actually did go and shoot a video review. Now, I, I never put it on, online, um, and I didn't really shoot it. To be honest, I set everything up. I had Carcassonne, that was the first game I was gonna do. I think the name of the series is gonna be Get In The Game, or What's In The Box, or I forget, was, I think it was Get In The Game. Anyway, so we were gonna get into Carcassonne. I tried shooting video, and man, was it ever tricky. I, it, I didn't appreciate just how difficult the whole process was. I'm stumbling over my words, I'm not saying things the way I want to, I'm not explaining things well. All the rest of it was a real, real eye-opener, to be honest. I think also, though, the reason why I was struggling with it was because I was trying to do it as a review. And I've talked about this in other places. I have this, I, I say it's almost an irrational aversion to giving my opinion about games over the internet, because I never mind it when anyone else does it. Like, that's, that's great. I don't always agree with all the opinions I hear, but I enjoy hearing other gamers' opinions about games. But I think on a personal level, so I'm not critiquing anyone else who does this, but just on a personal level, I struggle with the idea, if I tell someone a game is really great, and they go and buy it and they hate it, I'm gonna feel like I caused them to waste money. Or if I tell them a game's no good, they may miss an opportunity to play a game that they would personally really enjoy. So again, like I said, I don't know, I have no problem whatsoever with other people who do that. It's just, I felt like I, I just couldn't get comfortable with that idea. So that was my own hang up I had to just sort of deal with. 
So then it kind of occurred to me because Andrew and I picked up Mansions of Madness and this was a game that was very thematic and I was thinking, man, I'd love to be able to play this with more people. You know, maybe we could do a play by forum, but hey, wouldn't this game so visual, wouldn't it be great if we get the video camera out and actually as people make their moves, we could show the moves happening. We can move the guys around, we could roll the dice live and try to create that gamer gamers playing a game together experience except over the internet and taking turns. So came down to the basement here, <laughs> put the table out, spread the game out, and Andrew joined me and we gave it a go. We invited a few people to join us, a few people agreed to, and um, it seemed to go okay. I, I know I was having fun and really that's when the light switch went on for me because this was it. I was now getting to play games outside of the four walls of my own home with other people they were continuing to play with me and they seemed to be enjoying it and I was really enjoying it. And the other part of it that, that was important to me was I wanted to teach the game. I wanted to show how the game was played. And this game was, you know, it's, it's a little heavier game. It's more complex. Um, so, so this was a chance for me to try to teach the game and see if that came across clearly or not. Uh, I also learned how to make mistakes repeatedly and, and try to correct them. Um, but that was part of the learning process as well. And what surprised me, it's, believe me, it was a surprise, was that other people seemed to enjoy watching along with us. And that again, just allowed me to feel connected to this larger gaming community. And that was really, really what I was craving. And so that was a fantastic experience. Once that was done, I wanted to do more. And so Andrea, who was really helpful in the early stages, continued to stay with me. We did uh, several, Andrea's my daughter, we did several other games together. Uh, Luke joined us for games as well. And it just continued to, um, just to fulfill that part of me that wanted to be able to play these other games with a larger gaming community. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that really got on to me early was instead of having just inviting a, a few people to join us, invite everyone to join in. People can leave their comments and vote for what ideas they want best. That way everyone can feel like they're contributing to the gameplay. And hopefully, my feeling was that in addition to watching your views, if you wanted a, a deeper look into the game, if you wanted to see exactly how the game works, how those rules work together in an actual playthrough, then if you had the time and the inclination, you could watch along, you could play along and hopefully feel involved. And, and just all of that to help you make a more informed decision about your game. So really we just wanted to compliment the other great review videos that we were enjoying ourselves. So I think that's pretty much everything in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> I admit a rather large nutshell. I apologize, any of you still watching, I, I really appreciate that. Um, we, our series now, we call it Watch It Played. We're on our 17th playthrough of, of the game. Um, we're doing Zombie Side next. And, um, you know, I name dropped a fair bit in this video. Um, and the reason for that really was to express my appreciation to all of those people who take time out of their day to create board gaming media, to create content for us to watch and read and listen to and enjoy. It's really helped shape me as a gamer, it's helped me evolve. And, and it's certainly uh, made my enjoyment of this hobby all, all the more meaningful. So I just wanted to express that appreciation to them. There's lots of people I didn't name and, and possibly can't name all of them, uh, including my contemporaries, the people who started creating media content around the same time that I did. Um, many of those I've reached out to and, and been able to talk to, and I've enjoyed that interaction so much. It means a lot, but you know, it goes well beyond just the, the board game media creators because there's just all the pe other gamers who, who play along with us, watch our series, who are so generous with their kind comments about it and who have shared their interests of, of the hobby with me. And I, the reason I make such an effort to reply back to all of those is because, if you haven't guessed already, that's really the big part of this hobby that I enjoy the most, is that interaction. I and mean, if it was just me in my head all the time, thinking about games and, and what I enjoy about them, that wouldn't be any fun. But now I have an outlet for all of that enthusiasm, and it's great to have all that enthusiasm returned right back to me. So. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for this opportunity to be the Geek of the Week. It's just another extension of being able to reach out to more gamers and, and meet them and, and share that passion for this hobby. I hope you, those of you who have watched this, I hope you found it mildly interesting and have learned a little bit more about one of your Board Game Geek members. I am definitely going to keep my eye on this Geek of the Week thing because this seems like a lot of fun. I look forward to, to meet, meeting more people and learning more about them. I can't imagine I have to pick the next one. That's going to be so difficult, but I, I look forward to the challenge. And um, until we talk again, thanks for watching.